Since Michael and Sarah are coming back for a hometown childbirth, please get out, my mother-in-law said in a chilly voice. They were returning in three days. Me? I have to leave? I asked, stunned. Yes, we don't need another mother figure anymore. You've been redundant for a while now. Michael and his family will be living here, so make sure you're out by tomorrow, she continued. I always knew I wasn't truly accepted as part of the family. Since the day I got married, I'd only been seen as a wife. Never did I imagine they would tell me to leave after all these years. You barren failure. You are allowed to experience raising a child. You should be grateful. We have no obligation to support you anymore. It seems like Simon is tired of you too. What? Simon too. I gulped, feeling the shock set in. If it's not just a conspiracy between my mother-in-law and Michael, then I don't need to stand on ceremony with my husband anymore. Thinking it foolish to drive me out, but it was my mother-in-law who ignited this. What happens to this house now is none of my concern. May they face the reality they have ignored squarely and personally. I'm Anna Thompson, 45 years old, living with my husband and mother-in-law in a popular area close to the station. The access to the city center is superb. When we were house hunting, my husband, who had just been promoted to a managerial position, was particularly picky. The rent was steep, but the space and number of rooms made it worth the stretch. My husband, Simon, eight years my senior, a divorcee I met through a friend's introduction. I was comforted by the enveloping kindness unique to an older man, and after two years of dating, we decided to get married. Even when I told him about my infertility due to past illness, my husband's affection did not waver. Likewise, my feelings remained unchanged when I learned of the circumstances he carried. My husband had a son named Michael from his previous marriage. I'm truly sorry to ask you, who have never been married before, to live with my parents and son. I won't make you suffer in any other way. I'll make sure you're happy. That was the promise he made to me. To prevent me from feeling suffocated, my husband suggested moving to a spacious apartment where I could have my own room. Michael is turning 10 this year, and with my mom around, he won't need much care. You don't have to push yourself. After his divorce, my husband had been getting help with child care from his parents at their home. A few years later, Simon's father passed away in an accident, and it seems his mother took over as Michael's caretaker. From the first meeting, Michael wouldn't even make eye contact with me. I thought it might be his shy nature and that he was approaching a difficult age, so I didn't worry about it. As long as they accepted me as a member of the household, I was content. My mother-in-law was a quiet and refined person. When I visited to formally introduce myself after our engagement, she treated me with such politeness that I thought we would get along fine living together. I'll continue to prepare the meals as I have been. Simon comes home late, so it's okay if we eat at different times, right, Anna? I'll leave the cleaning and laundry to you. All right, let's work well together. After getting married, I switched from being a full-time employee at the pharmacy to a full-time part-timer because of the division of household chores. I started work a bit later in the morning, so I wouldn't get home until nearly 8 o'clock p.m. But dinner was always ready when I arrived. This was one thing that made me feel good about living together. My mother-in-law and Michael usually had dinner before I got home, so I was always eating alone. Even after getting married, I sometimes felt a sense of isolation, but I came to accept that this was our family style. However, from the beginning, my mother-in-law never really liked me and didn't consider me part of the family at all. Michael, the school's activity day is before summer, right? When is it? We're all going to see you. Sometime after getting married, I tried to break the ice with Michael, who still hadn't warmed up to me. No, I mean, as Michael faltered, my mother-in-law interjected, we'll go there, just Simon and me. Anna, you don't need to worry about it. I misunderstood her words, thinking she was just being considerate. I can get the day off work. 
Let's all go together. You don't need that. You're Simon's wife, and Michael's family has always been just Simon and me. I was lightly, no, quite shocked. When I brought it up with my husband at night, he said, Mom's been clinging to Michael. She probably thinks you're trying to take him away. I'll talk to her. Eventually, I began to join as a mother at the activity day, but Michael and I rarely spent any time together outside of school events. Sometimes I could tell Michael wanted to say something, but my mother-in-law always cut in between us. I later found out that she had been bad-mouthing me to Michael. Anna said she could be happy with Simon if Michael weren't around. She's a terrible person. Dad must be deceived by her, too. If a boy in his formative years hears such things, it wouldn't be strange for him to distrust me. It was a sickening story, but at that time, I hadn't imagined that my mother-in-law could do such a thing. After graduating high school, Michael immediately moved in with his girlfriend and left home. As soon as he started college, a year after, he started working. He married her without a ceremony. Once Michael moved out, my mother-in-law surprisingly stopped doing housework altogether. Instead, it seemed that picking on me had become her sole entertainment. She stopped cooking, which she used to do before, and now just sits at the dining table waiting for me to come home. Without a moment to sit down, I would stand in the kitchen and prepare dinner. You're really inefficient. At this rate, it'll take you all night. I was never good at cooking, partly because I had always relied on my mother-in-law to prepare the meals. Whenever I did manage to cook, she would taste each dish and invariably complain. This tastes awful. I'm sorry, I'm trying my best. You're astonishingly tone-deaf when it comes to flavors, Anna. It's a good thing Michael never had to eat this. How terrible. If she thought so, she might as well make it herself. But it seemed she just wanted to complain to me, not just about the meals, but she started nitpicking everything from the cleaning I never used to do to the laundry. Why are there so many wrinkles on the laundry? You have to vacuum every nook and cranny. You really can't do anything right. Didn't your family teach you anything? With that, my mother-in-law sighed while looking at me. Being belittled even about my family, I clenched my fists in frustration. I don't know how you won over Simon, but I can't see much charm in you as a woman. And she always concluded with the same line. If you hadn't come, Michael would have never left. I understood that there was a gaping hole in her heart since Michael had left. Maybe it was what they call empty nest syndrome. If taking it out on me made her feel better, that's what I told myself to endure it. But her bullying took on new energy after a certain event. That event was the pregnancy announcement from Michael's wife, Sarah. The joy my mother-in-law exhibited was unlike anything I had seen before. It's Michael's baby. It's bound to be adorable. Yeah, it'll be my first grandchild. Watching the two of them rejoice, I was happy too, but my mother-in-law's excitement was beyond normal. Probably because Michael asked her grandma, can Sarah have our baby at your place? Sarah's family home is an hour away by plane, and since they have no one else to rely on here, they turn to us for help. Of course, my mother-in-law wouldn't dream of turning down Michael's request. The phone calls from Michael started to become frequent, and her excitement went through the roof. The next day after getting the news, she started preparing enthusiastically, from cleaning out Michael's room to preparing the bedding and making a list of baby items. It was like she had great-grandchild fever. Naturally, I had to get involved, too. When I returned from work, Anna, I vacuumed Michael's room, so you need to wipe the floors and the windows, and please wax them, too. This weekend, we're going to the department store to look at baby cribs. Cleaning and waxing at night was tough, especially after a long day at work. If I even thought about cutting corners, I'd be told to do it over again. Moreover, my mother-in-law started asking for money, and before I knew it, the house was overflowing with baby stuff. Anna, I need you to withdraw some money tomorrow. There are things I want to get ready for the baby. Again, 
Isn't it wasteful to prepare so much when Sarah and Michael haven't even arrived? Shouldn't we wait and choose together with them? I had wanted to meet my mother-in-law's requests, but I was troubled by the relentless spending. How can you be so cold? It's Simon's grandchild. Oh, that's right, you're not related to Michael by blood. You don't care, do you? That's not true, please don't say that. I just thought Sarah might want to pick things out herself. Wouldn't you want to choose things for your own child? Perhaps because I was making a valid point, my mother-in-law glared at me sharply. I instantly regretted my words, but it was too late. My mother-in-law walked back to her room, clearly upset. I thought about it, stunned by how she had talked about me and Michael. The next morning, she didn't leave her room, likely still angry. Simon had a three-day business trip starting that day. As he left, he called through her door, I'm leaving. Please don't dash mom's hopes for a great-grandchild. She hasn't been the same since Michael left. You were worried too, right? I was worried, but if we keep spending like this, we'll have nothing left when Michael and Sarah arrive, right? Simon's face immediately turned sour. Are you saying my earnings are too low? That's not what I'm saying at all. Simon just said fine and left with a look of dissatisfaction. Discussions about money always end up like this. Since I'm the one managing our finances, I can't help but think ahead. Of course, there's a reason for that. We've been married for 13 years. Simon has provided me with a very comfortable life. Your part-time income is for you to enjoy. Simon had always told me so. I saved everything beyond what I needed for myself. Even though it's in my name, I consider it our shared property. But then Simon's company's performance declined, and over the last five years, his salary has dropped to two-thirds of what it was when we first got married. While there's uncertainty whether his company will last until his retirement, he doesn't seem to consider changing jobs. For appearances in front of my mother-in-law, my husband couldn't give up his title as a department head. Now I'm the one paying the rent and he covers the living expenses. We've kept this from my mother-in-law to save my husband's face. That day, I left work a bit early to apologize to my mother-in-law. When I got home, she was already sitting at the dining table waiting for me. I'm sorry about yesterday. I went too far, I said. But my mother-in-law didn't respond. Instead, she blindsided me with something else. Since Michael and Sarah are coming back for a hometown childbirth, please get out. My mother-in-law stated in a chilly voice, the return of the eldest son and his wife was scheduled in three days. Me, I have to leave? I asked, confused and stunned. Yes, we don't need another mother figure anymore. You've been redundant for a while now. Michael and his family will be living here, so make sure you're out by tomorrow, she continued. I knew I was never truly accepted as part of the family. Since the day I got married, I've been treated as a wife thus far. I should have suspected something when Michael was coming back for the birth. You barren failure. You were allowed to experience raising a child. You should be grateful. We have no obligation to support you anymore. It seems like Simon is tired of you too. What, Simon too? Yes, maybe he's getting on well with a new girlfriend by now. I gulped down my saliva. Could such a thing be happening? Lately, my relationship with my husband has grown distant. Could it be a trap I fell into, thinking my husband would never? I remembered that up until a year ago, he never had overnight business trips. All right, I'll eat out tonight, I said, grabbing my bag and leaving the house to walk aimlessly. I needed to calm my severely shaken heart, worried about my husband. As I walked, I tried calling my husband's cell phone. Despite what my mother-in-law had said, I still wanted to talk to him. But he didn't answer, no matter how many times I rang. So I called his office and was told he had taken a couple of days off. My mother-in-law's words started to seem more credible. Could he really be on a trip with another woman? Bad thoughts began to crowd my mind, and I was overwhelmed with emotion 
tears streaming down my face. Staggering along, I noticed the tavern behind the station. It was a place we used to go to often when we first moved here. It's still here. I thought as I went inside. Welcome. The tavern owner's expression clouded for a moment when he saw me, then he nodded slightly in recognition. Did he remember me? Hey, long time no see. It's been about eight years. I used to come here a lot with my husband. Yes, it's been a while. I remember you. I couldn't help but smile, feeling a sense of relief wash over me. Can I get a beer and a mixed plate of grilled chicken, please? Sure. The owner was always a man of few words, and that hadn't changed. I took out my cell phone and the screensaver lit up. It was a photo of us when Michael turned 18, looking sharp in the slim suit we had picked out together. I really wanted us to be closer as a family. As I looked on, a waitress brought over the beer and grilled chicken. The cold beer washed down my throat, and it felt like it took the day's fatigue with it. Can I really move out tomorrow? Searching for moving companies that could do the job the next day, I found one. I also looked up junk buyers and saved two companies in my favorites. Changing the screensaver on my phone seemed to clear my head completely. The beer and the grilled chicken tasted exceptional. I decided to think about everything once I got home. As I started walking away from the tavern, I was called from behind. Turning around, a young waitress from the tavern was running towards me. Excuse me, are you Mrs. Thompson? I couldn't help but notice the screensaver on your phone. Huh, yes, that's me. I responded, wondering if there really were such things as divine interventions. Your husband, he's having an affair with one of our employees. Her youthful sense of justice was apparent. So that was the look on the owner's face. My husband was still coming to the tavern, involved with a longtime part-time female worker. When there aren't many customers, they talk the whole time and leave together after closing. They're always all over each other. It's really gross. I couldn't help but give a wry smile at her frankness. We exchanged contact information. I'll let you know if anything happens, she said, which felt reassuring to me who had no allies. My mother-in-law's words were true. Maybe because my head had cleared instead of sadness, I felt a rising anger within me. Might as well go all out and finish this. I booked an appointment with one of the moving companies I had saved earlier. If it wasn't just a conspiracy between my mother-in-law and Michael, then I suppose I no longer need to honor my husband. I thought it foolish to be driven out, but it was my mother-in-law who had sparked this. Whatever becomes of this house now is not my concern. When I got home, I packed my belongings until midnight. I was without hesitation. The moving company I had booked for exactly 2 o'clock p.m. arrived on time. As you asked, I'm moving out today. The movers are coming, so I'll take everything I bought with me. I wish you could erase even the trace that you were here. As she wished, I cleared out all the furniture and appliances, everything I had paid for with my part-time job money, besides the rent and living expenses. Watching the procession of my belongings being taken out, my mother-in-law started to panic. Wait, Anna, what are you doing? If you take all this, how will we live? To leave no trace behind, I'm taking everything I bought. You can start a completely new life tomorrow. Suppressing a laugh, I ignored her protests and had everything taken out. She complained loudly to the movers, but there was nothing she could do. All that was left in the house were the piles of baby gear and her old dresser from before the marriage. Well then, I bid you farewell. There should be no trace of me left, so enjoy your life with Simon, Michael, and his family. Leaving her sitting there stunned, I placed the keys on the table and left the room. I had the movers hold on to my things for a while, and I decided to stay with a single colleague for some time. Feeling a sense of completion, I slept soundly that night. 
It was a week later when I finally heard from my husband. I wonder if he was scheming with that other woman. While my husband was dragging his feet, I got a call from the young woman at the tavern. Got a good shot, so I'll send it to you. In it, there was my husband chatting up a not-so-young woman at the place. Maybe out of a sense of justice, the young woman must have followed them after they closed. There was also a photo attached of the two entering a hotel. Even in such times, the cheating continues, I thought, and any last bit of affection I had for my husband dissipated. I asked for the woman's name and to have her address looked up. The next day, after I had all the evidence of the affair, my husband called. Anna, where are you? Michael and his family are here, too. Aren't you going to come home soon? No, I'm not coming back. Your mom told me to leave. I'm done here. Michael and his family are going to live with you now, right? I knew it. Michael and his family were out of money and looking to crash at our place. I heard that after graduating from a vocational school, they've been hopping from job to job, and now they're working part-time. No, I want you back, Anna. I went to the pharmacy and they said you're off for a bit. Got a place to crash. Yeah, I'm fine, so don't worry about me. Your mom and Michael didn't like me, right? I reckon they're happy to have the place to themselves without me around. My snide comment left my husband speechless. He knew his mother and Michael never accepted me as family, but pretended not to see it. Well, all right, I have something to say, so I'll come back there once. Yes, for the sake of my future, I need to finish this last chapter. My husband replied with a relieved plea in his voice. And then, days later, I went back to the house for the first time in a long while. There were some new pieces of furniture and appliances inside. When Michael and Sarah saw me, they just nodded from their seats on the sofa without getting up. As I took a seat, my mother-in-law glared at me with a scary look on her face. The atmosphere was tense. Just as I thought to get things done and leave quickly, Michael spoke up. What are you doing here? You took everything from the house. What kind of monster does that? Dad's been supporting you and you've had it easy. I sighed. I took everything because I paid for it. I wanted to remove all traces of me just as you wanted, right? But that's crazy, right? There's no way you could afford all that just working part-time at the pharmacy. My husband still hadn't talked to his mother about it. When I glanced at my husband, he started talking as if he resigned himself. We've been getting by on what Anna and I both make for a little while now. Then the stuff you took should be both yours. Instead of my speechless husband, I decided to speak up. Simon's company has been doing poorly and his salary plummeted. That's why, for the past five years, I've been covering what's missing. But that wasn't enough and now I'm the one paying our rent. My mother-in-law looked at my husband with surprise. I'm not just a part-timer. I'm a part-time pharmacist and the pay is quite good. I'm making more than Simon now. At my words, my husband awkwardly looked away. My mother-in-law's eyes were frantically shifting between my husband and me. From now on, Michael, you'll be paying the rent. You're going to live here, right? After all the help your grandma's given, it's time for you to take care of her. Michael looked at me with a shocked expression when I dropped the news suddenly. Rent? How much is it? It's $5,600. Good luck. Since it seems my role as a mother is over, I don't have an obligation to take care of you anymore. Pull yourself together. You're going to be a father soon. Michael murmured with a shake of his head. That's impossible. It was Sarah who raised her voice upon hearing this. Wait, $5,600? Weren't we supposed to live here for free? Covering rent and living expenses. I quit my job and Michael, you only make $33,000 a month. What are we going to do? I almost burst out laughing. Don't worry, Sarah, you can move to a cheaper place. Simon still makes a decent salary. Hearing this, Sarah's face relaxed a bit. Oh, since I'll be leaving from you, Simon, life might still get tough with your mistress, huh? At that, 
Sarah finally broke down in tears. It was my husband who panicked. What? What are you talking about? Oh, your mother told me about the new woman. I guess it's time to end my role as a wife, too. That's got to be a lie from Mom. You're the only one for me. He must think there's no evidence. Indeed, it hasn't even been ten days since I left the house. Wouldn't that hurt Mary if she heard you? Well, I'll get in touch about that later. At the mention of Mary's name, my husband jolted, realizing that I knew everything. He held his head and sighed. This is not the atmosphere to write a divorce paper. Well, then, I'll be going now. Please talk to me further through a lawyer. Neither my husband Simon nor Michael said anything more, staying silent as I grabbed my bag and stood up. My mother-in-law stood up simultaneously, slamming her hands on the table. She yelled with a voice too strong for an elderly woman. What the hell? It's all your fault our home is in shambles. I was instantly irritated. It was you who told me to leave. It was you who said Simon had another woman and you interfered with my relationship with Michael. Everything was you. I felt a surge of heat in my chest. I regretted not being more assertive with my relationship with Michael, not holding back because of my mother-in-law. Michael has nothing to do with this. It's time for you to step up. Simon is going through a hard time. You should support him as his wife, take responsibility as a family member. What is she even talking about? If she hadn't called Michael back home, if she hadn't hinted at Simon's affair, I would still happily support Simon and this home. I always believed in and supported Simon. I don't need any roles anymore. There's no going back. Then, looking firmly into my mother-in-law's eyes, I slowly said, I was never really accepted as a family member from the start, so I can't take responsibility as one. My mother-in-law's lips tightened into a line and she was trembling. I slipped past the silent mother-in-law and quickly left the room. Afterward, Simon agreed to the divorce rather easily. It seems my determination was strong and he couldn't counter the evidence of the affair. Shortly after, it seemed like they started the process of moving out of the apartment. In the end, Michael and Sarah went back to their apartment and never lived with the mother-in-law. Simon seems to be considering remarriage, but Mary was furious over the alimony and his request for her to live with his mother. I've heard they're considering whether to place my mother-in-law in a care facility. After all the love she poured into her son and grandson, it's somewhat sad to think they're ready to abandon her now. Perhaps she served her purpose too. If my mother-in-law had said nothing back then and it had just been a simple trip home for childbirth, maybe we would still be living together. After the divorce, Michael sent me an apology letter. He shared how, as a child, he wished he had been more spoiled and how he couldn't talk to me because his grandma didn't like it. He also mentioned how happy he was when I attended his school events. Maybe I should have reached out more. Perhaps then we could have had a different relationship. Even though it's over between us, I still quietly pray for Michael's happiness. I've returned to work as a pharmacist and quickly rented an apartment close to my job. I didn't feel right keeping the furniture and appliances I took, so I had a junk removal service pick them up and dispose of them. Life without my mother-in-law's harassment is peaceful and comfortable. For now, I want to live for my own happiness, not someone else's.